So, we're talking about grace, I guess we should have freebies. Uh, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a, in a family that would say grace, usually only for dinner, but that was a thing that we did, would say grace. And of course, you know, you grow up in this, so it becomes normal. And then somewhere around age 10 or 11, you begin thinking about these things that your family's doing. And I'm sitting there at the dinner table, and this thought kind of comes to me and says, why do we say grace to God when we get our food from Ralph's? I mean, seriously. I mean, we, we went to church, so I knew where God hung out. But we never brought food back from there. We always brought food back from the grocery store. Ralph's, Safeways, Albert's. I mean, we were very egalitarian in these matters. But the bottom line was, food comes from the grocery store. Why do we give thanks to God? Now, I didn't really get all worked up about this. It was just one of these little aha moments. Well, fast forward about six years, and I have a summer job working for my uncle in the wheat harvest in eastern Washington. And I got out there, uh, I, had, I had been there, visited the f before, but never during harvest time. Uh, and I came driving in from the, the Greyhound bus stop where I got off. My uncle met me and we drove through all these wheat fields and I was really amazed because I hadn't really seen wheat ready for harvest. It's, you know, golden is indeed what it looks like. The, the crop was good and it was so thick it looked like you could walk on top of it. So the wheat's about two and a half feet high, but literally when you walked into a field, you felt like you could just step right up and then walk the rest of the way across on the top. It was that thick. And so I had this wonderful time. We had a great harvest. I spent a month there driving a dump truck. I'm 16 years old driving this dump truck that takes 10 tons of wheat down to the silo and dumps it. And this is like, you know, for little boys who play with trucks, this is like pretty cool stuff. So that, that's year number one. Year number two, I drive out there, had a great time, so I want to come again, drive out there, and we're driving through to get to the place. And I look across these wheat fields and all I see is dirt and these little tiny sprigs of, of wheat stalks that are about that high. And my uncle was a dry land farmer, which is to say he had no irrigation. So the only time rain came is when God sent it. And God didn't send rain that year. The next year I went out, looked like a great harvest again. We were about to cut wheat and uh, my uncle says, yeah, you got it. It's got to get dry enough. We just had a thunderstorm not long ago. So they have this whole thing where they'll test the, the, the moisture in the wheat because otherwise when you put it in the silo, it will ferment. So you make beer instead of wheat, roughly speaking. Um, and uh, so lo and behold, we just about dry, so we'd probably be able to do it on Friday. It rains on Friday. We wait another three or four days. We check the moisture. I spent 30 days there, and I was able to cut wheat for half of one day. And I asked my uncle Dan, what happens if it doesn't quit raining? He says, well, the wheat will mold in the heads and we won't be able to harvest it. We'll just have to plow it under. He actually did get it in. The day after I left, they started cutting and they got in their crop. The year after that, I remember driving out of the wheat field. One of the big fears you have is fires in a wheat field because dry wheat stalks go up like crazy. I am driving out of the wheat field to the silo, and I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and there's this big pillar of smoke coming out behind me. And I didn't know where it was from, so I went and I dropped the load, and I drive back to the wheat field we were cutting, and I get closer and closer and closer, and I suddenly realize that's our field. And the fire had started in the neighbor's field, <laughs> spread sideways about 40 yards, and then it hit the field that we were cutting, and it burned a swath, about three quarters of the field just burned, probably in under 10 minutes. And I've never said grace over a meal quite the same way as after I was a farmer. Because I realized even in the 20th and 21st century, 
The only reason we eat is by the grace of God. Ralph's doesn't give you food. They buy food and you buy it from them. The only place you ever find food is because God said, let me open my hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. And when he does that, we eat. When he doesn't, we don't. And I tell that story by by way of introduction to what I wanna do today is to expand our thinking a little bit about grace from what Dr. Stetzer gave us last time. Because he talked about sola gratia and he gave a wonderful overview of kind of the history of that doctrine, particularly as it pertains both to the Reformation era when this language was kind of came into uh, life of its own and also uh, focused with that on the issue that the Reformation was focused on with, with sola gratia, which is that of salvation. How are we saved? We are saved by grace alone, through faith by grace alone. Um, and so he unpacked that wonderfully. I have no need to go do a repeat performance, but I do want to make one point is that it's not only that we are saved by grace alone, we live by grace alone. Every single morning, every single meal, every breath you draw is a breath of grace. And I'd like us to stop and think about that just a little bit more closely this morning. The passage that I've chosen to, to look at here comes from, <laughs> it comes from second, the back end of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And if you're familiar with 2 Corinthians, you realize really chapter 8 and 9, I don't know why they bothered dividing it except it gets long otherwise, but it is a long run talking about this gift, a grace that, God, that Paul is collecting from the uh, believers there in the uh, Peloponnesian Peninsula to take down to the believers in Palestine because they're experiencing a famine. They have a wheat shortage going on down there. Um, and so he talks a lot about the idea of giving. And the thing that it all begins with is the fact that you have received these wonderful gifts pass them on. So he develops that, and this is, you know, I, there's no way I can read two full chapters now. So all I did is I picked the last section of this because it summarizes the whole. If you were to, to, to break out your little, uh, you know, Greek tools or whatever and count the number of times the word grace and its derivatives occurred, charis and, and uh, charismata, uh, uh, eucharisto, all these other verbs that are built off that same core, I think it's neck and neck competition whether these two chapters in 2 Corinthians or Romans 5 and 6 have more occurrence of the grace stem. I didn't bother sorting them out, but it is just thick in this section. Paul's in Romans is talking about grace relative to salvation. Paul in Corinthians is talking about grace relative to everything else. And here's what he says in, in uh, beginning in verse 11 here. You'll be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And that one sentence is really where I will focus, but let me read what goes on and follows there. For the ministry of this service, referring to the service he's uh, bringing this offering to the, to the saints in Palestine, the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will be glorifying God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. It's a wonderful passage. That whole section is a wonderful section. And it's a great example of this idea that all the things that we have, that we need for life, are gifts of God. And as Paul puts it in the beginning of verse 11, you'll be enriched in every way. 
So he's talking here about all the material benefits. In this case, he's actually bringing a money offering, not a grain offering, because, well, he's got to take it across the Mediterranean Sea, and that's a perilous journey. So he's talking about those sorts of things in chapters eight and nine. Um, And so clearly, this grace is not just tied to a salvation thing, but it's tied to an everything thing. Uh, Then he goes on to say, you'll be enriched in every way, so you can be generous in every way. In other words, God's grace has a notion of reciprocity that's built into it. When you receive something from grace, there's this natural response to give graciously to somebody else. So the point of grace is not just that you get it freely, but you get it so freely that you feel compelled to share it with someone else freely. And so you see Paul identifying here this kind of cycle of reciprocity relative to grace that is built into God's economy. And the result of all of that, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God, the result of this kind of cycle of grace and reciprocity is kind of not so much a cycle of grace, but you might call it a spiral of grace. In other words, it spirals upwards. Grace given, grace received, grace given. The result of all that is it spirals upward and upward until it finds its home in the glory of Jesus Christ himself. And that's the vision of God's economy of grace that Paul's describing here. He says, guys, this is the thing that you're a part of. So that's the picture in this passage. Now, let me go back to the Reformation and just talk about salvation by grace and grace alone, sola gratia. The enemy of that in the Reformation time was basically salvation by works. The idea is you don't get salvation by grace, you get salvation by earning it. It becomes a reward for some behavior, some sacrifice, something that you have done. So in the Reformation context, kind of the defeater of grace, the enemy of grace is works. I got to thinking about that in 2023. And I started thinking, how many people do I really know who are all worked up about working and earning their salvation? Now, there are ways that we do that. But as a prevailing culture, here's my argument. The number one concern we should have about defeating grace is not works, but rather entitlement. That we have so many good gifts, we have so many good things, that we think we're entitled to just have good things. And anything that comes that isn't good, any good that we don't actually happen to have, we have a feeling like, I've been cheated. My rights have been denied. And the more I thought about that, the more worried I became because I feel like entitlement is like a broomstick that you stick into the spokes of the wheel of grace to keep it from turning. To the extent you feel entitled to things, To that exact extent, you do not experience them as an act of grace, and therefore you do not offer in response to them acts of gratitude, either by way of praise or by a reciprocity of giving that gift onward to other people. We short circuit the economy of grace. Let me just do a quick contrast. I was thinking about this. With works, your basic feeling is I earned it. With entitlement, your basic feeling is I deserve it. I have a right to it. With works, when what you want isn't delivered, you tend to doubt yourself. You go, oh, I haven't worked enough. I haven't done enough. So it becomes introspective reflection and you work harder for it. Under entitlement, when you don't get what you want, you tend to doubt God. You were supposed to give me this. You didn't deliver the goods. In works, when it still doesn't get delivered after the initial miss of the thing, uh, you work even harder. You double down, you do more. And this is describing Martin Luther, right? This is just exactly Martin Luther's experience as an Augustinian monk, where he felt this desperation of not knowing, not earning, and he had to do more and had to do more and had to do more. Under the entitlement option, when you don't get it and then you still don't get it, you become angry, you become judgmental, you become resentful. I've been denied my rights. 
And the end result from works is an exhausting cycle of effort that's never enough. The end result of entitlement is an exhausting cycle of disappointment that leads to bitterness, a loss of hope, and anger towards God and other people. They're both terrible exchanges for grace. And so what I'd like to do is take a little bit of time just to unpack this kind of cautionary message about entitlement just a little bit more fully and just ask the question, how can we cure our entitlement problem? <laughs> what can we do about this? I, I had a bunch of stuff for making an argument for the case for entitlement. I mean, we have McDonald's, you deserve it. We have, how many you deserve it ads are out there, by the way? So yeah, it's everywhere, but as I thought about it, I said, Rick, I think you're probably arguing with people who aren't denying it. Uh, my bet is you do feel that sense because we are those sorts of, of folks. So how do we cultivate um, a sense of gratitude? How do we lose a bit of the edge of our sense of entitlement? First off, is we may need to make God large in our eyes. We need to see him through the windshield, not through the passenger side window. And when we see him, we need to do that, you know, iPhone thing where you like zip it out, zoom in on God. See him in the front, see him big, see him large. And one of the ways we do this, I've discovered, paradoxically, ironically, and wildly problematically, is actually kind of a work salvation thing again, is to begin to think, oh, God's really this big deal, and you have this feeling like God's always watching you, and God's gonna judge you, and God is like, we make him hyper holy. And everything we do, we get really caught by the fact we might be doing something wrong. And so your God gets bigger and bigger, probably gets just a little bit meaner and meaner, certainly a finer and finer point that he, he, he refines that knife of righteousness and holiness to. And you get this ever increasing anxiety about this transcendent, completely other, completely higher, completely holy God. And that is exactly not what I'm thinking about when I see we need to make God bigger. Instead, we need to develop a world, an eyesight that sees in the world a God who's infinitely gracious, and therefore, I'm becoming infinitely grateful. I'm becoming constantly overwhelmed with my attitude. As Paul describes in, in 2 Corinthians 9-11, as he puts it, we are enriched in every way, so we become generous in every way. We begin to see, and Paul describes wonderfully in this way that you guys have some money now. He says, share it. Why? Because sooner or later you won't have money, but somebody else will who are gonna enter into an economy that is not marked by buying and selling, but by giving and receiving. You're not busy earning things. You're busy giving and receiving. And never is there a sense of mandatory obligation. There's a sense in freeness of the gift as you give it and freeness to receive the gift when it's given to you. And I imagine a lot of you who sit in this room have noticed it's hard not only sometimes to give a gift, but it's equally hard to receive a gift. We kind of are grace allergic. And we need to really reprogram our thinking. As I already mentioned, every single thing, and we'll unpack this a little bit more later, that we have, we get by the grace of God. So to make God big, we just need to pay more attention to what he's already given us. We don't have to get more snarky about how holy he is. We need to get more thoughtful about all the gifts we receive on a daily basis. So, First, see God large. Secondly, try diving into the pool of reciprocity. <laughs> uh, enter into that economy of grace. Instead of buying and selling, do the giving and receiving thing. Um, and this is kind of thematic in the New Testament. Here in this passage we see give, in this case material goods, because God has given to you. So you see God is the initiator of this process by an act of gracious giving. And he says, in light of the fact that you've received that, feel free to graciously give to others. So we give because he's given to us. 
But it's not just material things that work that way, right? What about forgiving? And Paul says in Colossians chapter three, forgive as Christ Jesus himself has forgiven you. So why do we extend forgiveness to another person? Because we take a deep breath and say, how much forgiveness have I myself received? And you say, you know what? I've received a lot. I can probably afford to give a little. And so you forgive as Jesus has forgiven you. We comfort as he himself has comforted us. Um, as Paul puts this from 2 Corinthians 1, but Paul puts it there, we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And so again, you have this picture of an abundance being poured out, in this case, an abundance of comfort. Why? So you can turn and comfort others and their affliction as well. An economy of reciprocity. I receive from God, I in turn receive the gift of giving that which I've received to others. We've received kindness, so we share in kindness to one another. Romans 2.4 talks about the riches of his kindness. Ephesians 2 uh, describes the immeasurable riches of his grace in the kindness he's shown towards us in Christ Jesus. And so this notion that God pours out kindness upon us. What should we do with this overflow of kindness? I've got a good idea. Be kind to somebody else. Just be kind to somebody else. And I wonder as I think through these things, how can we possibly be stingy, unforgiving, mean, and hard-hearted towards one another? towards other people in the church, towards a culture, even a culture that doesn't always treat us well. How much have we received? How can we possibly return back in response to that? Stinginess, unforgivingness, meanness, and hard-heartedness. We need to wade into this economy of grace. God will give you all the kindness that you need. You'll never outshare him when it comes to kindness. You won't become kind bankrupt because you're gonna overspend your account by extending that to others. And that is the consistent imagery of the New Testament. So often it isn't just that God gives you, but it explicitly tells you he is given in abundance. And all of the examples I just identified here are exactly those kinds of explicit examples. He's not just given, he's given in abundance so much that you don't honestly know what to do with this. Second, third, whatever this is, I don't know. Here's another thing in terms of uh, cultivating a sense of gratitude. Uh, when it comes to grace, the only thing you have to pay is attention. Just pay attention. Look at the world around you. Uh, David, uh, the uh, creation psalms in general are a wonderful example, whether they be by David or by others. Psalm 104 is one of my favorites. Um, and let me just, you have this picture of David sitting here. I don't know, I don't think that there's an explicit title that it's from David, but I'm going to just refer to it like it is because hey, it's the mythic Psalm of David, right? So you have this image of him wandering around in this wilderness sort of place. If you've ever been to the Holy Land, well, if you've ever been to Joshua Tree, right? It's kind of the same thing, just on a different continent. Um, things are kind of desolate there. And you have this sense of David looking around at what he thought at first was desolate and someone saying, oh my gosh, there's so many things here. And he begins looking at the world that he sees and he says, you know, every drink of water is a gift of grace. He says, you make the springs gush forth in valleys and they give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst and from your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Every drink you ever drink is a drink of grace. Every bit of shelter you ever have 
David looks in verse 17 and 18, he says, in them the birds build their nests. The stork has, in her home, has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the badger. Everybody's house is a gift of God. Every morsel of food, the livestock, the beasts of the field, the lions are all out seeking their prey in Psalm 104. And they all find it by grace, as God puts it. These all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they're filled with good things. Every morsel of food, every breath you breathe is a gift from God. David writes, when, they, when you hide your face, God, they are dismayed. And when you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. We breathe by the breath of life that's borrowed from God. And when we die, the body goes back to the earth and that breath of life has a little stamp on it that says return to sender. And it goes back to God who gave it. And ultimately, the land itself and life itself is birthed and rebirthed by God. He says, when you send forth your spirit, they are created, referring, recreated. So kind of referring to these animals that he just talked about losing their breath of life. When you send forth your spirit, they regain it. And then the, the earth itself is renewed. You renew the face of the ground. And you're like, wow, every single thing Everywhere I turn is a gracious gift to God. And all we have to do is put on the glasses to see it. A final note on this is that you cultivate a heart of gratitude by also learning to embrace the acceptance of your sufferings. It's a hard world. It's a fallen world. It's a hard world we live in. Within our own community in the last few days, we've had uh, Dr. Alina Berry passed away um, tragically, unforeseen. I just spent an hour and a half talking with her at the retreat about plans for the coming year, some things that uh, we were gonna be working on. And uh, there's a sense of, of, of losses, like something's been ripped out of me. Um, the one thing I'd like to say is you read through the New Testament, every bit as much as I have of these other things, you see consistently relative to suffering. The idea that hidden within suffering is grace. There's kind of a sense that in the New Testament when you squeeze a suffering tight enough, the juice of grace drips out. And it doesn't make the suffering vanish, but it does bring wonderful good even out of the suffering. Suffering in that sense is not a gratitude preventer, it's a gratitude opportunity. Don't try and turn the badness into goodness, but find within that badness those goodnesses, those grace, those reminders that they have built within them of the goodness of God. Well, to close, let me just give you what I'm going to call my uh, evening gratitude stretching exercises. Um, I had some really bad back problems three years ago, and I thought I was gonna have, I didn't know what I was gonna have, but nothing looked good. And I went to a physical therapist and she said, you know what? And she had read this diagnosis that looked kind of grim and said, is, is bad, I know this sounds bad, she says, but actually I think that we don't probably need surgery and here's what you need to do. And she gave me this whole set of stretches that I have been doing every single day since December of 2019. And I am so grateful that I've done them. I haven't had surgery. I'm running again. Um, so many things I never thought I'd have. So I'm kind of thinking that maybe the same sort of a thing with some gratitude stretches would be valuable. So here's a thought. Before you go to bed tonight, there's all, all going to be just evening things you could do. Number one, list 10 items, 10 places, 
10 people in whom you encountered the grace of God today. Now, you may not be able to do that the first time. That's what I learned about that stretchy, stretchy thing. Uh, the first time, said, what I want you to do is lean over and touch your toes. I'm like, that's as far as it goes, honey. Um, so I understand that you may need to practice this, but cultivate the ability to stretch and touch those toes. Then give voice to your gratitude. In other words, when you receive something from somebody, tell them thank you. Acknowledge the grace they've given you. And then finally, as you go to bed at night, stop and think, what could I do tomorrow to pass on grace? Make a plan for becoming a grace distribution agency, so to speak. Um, and I think in the course of doing that, you'll find your grace muscles begin to stretch and your gratitude begins to grow. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.